Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the fourth Sunday of Advent in year B, 2023, for December 24, which is a challenge, we know, we we'll, can talk about that, but they are from 2 Samuel is the first reading, ch- chapter 7, 1 through 11, and verse 16. The psalm is Psalm 89, 1 through 4, and then 19 through 26. Our second reading is Romans chapter 16, 25 through 27. And then our gospel reading is Luke 1, 26 through 38, the Annunciation to Mary. So happy fourth Sunday of Advent. And happy birthday to you. Oh, thank you. (laughs) And when we do the podcast for Christmas Eve, will you also wish me a happy birthday? We will wish you happy birthday for Christmas Eve also. <laughs> Thank you. So it, uh, it it's interesting. Do you gain because, another year? What's that? Do you gain another year if we sing twice? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> just, just once. But uh, yeah, here we are on Christmas Eve morning. I was actually born in the morning. I'm sure that all of our listeners would want to know that. I have a funny story about that that I'm just going to go ahead and tell. So my mother is, was a, uh, well, pastor's wife, and it's Christmas Eve, and my dad's a pastor. And the night before, she went into labor and the went to the hospital and asked the doctor, what time do you think the baby will be born? And the doctor said, I think about 8 a.m. Well, then sure enough, I was born at 8.01. So look at you. My mother was astonished and she's like, doctor, look, it's 8.01. And he said, yeah, I know. I'm losing my touch. (laughs) 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 That's the one reason I remember that I was born in the morning and my parents were always wonderful about doing something in the morning to celebrate and uh because we always celebrated christmas eve on in the evening or christmas in the evening on christmas eve anyway back to the gospel and back to advent 4 i one thing that i want to point out immediately that i was just really struck by is in the commentary and I can't, I mean, I think I've noticed this before, but just never really thought about it uh, by Raj Nadella is that the, when, so a Gabriel makes, as, as we see, seven major pronouncements to Mary in a matter of minutes, right? And, and yet at, at the end, what gets Mary to uh, here am I? is the promise that the of the miracle miraculous birth or the miraculous pregnancy of Elizabeth mm. and that uh that Mary has no questions after that and that uh, that it's as as the commentary puts it it's the assurance that another woman someone she knew well would walk with her during this uncertain journey that convinced Mary. And I found that to be, uh, I had never thought about it in that way, that it's, that was that promise of her cousin Elizabeth of her similar experience and that they would, they would be able to walk through this together that, that leads her to be able to say, here am I, uh, and that, uh, and I am also a servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And so, uh, where to go homiletically with that? I guess I would say that there is something so profound in that the promise of God to these two women uh, that is that is the act of God's, uh, the act of God's love and act of God's favor and God's regard that sees both of them in, in their states. And that, that is, uh, that's also the promise of, of Jesus. Uh, it's the promise of the gospel, uh, that, uh, that God finds favor in the least of these 
and uh, and God will favor you. So there's that's that's the first thing I wanted to say. I just found that to be really wow, powerful. Indeed, indeed. So who are your you know who are your Elizabeths? Who are your Marys? Right. Who will who will uh, accompany you in this in this marvel <laughs> um, and and miraculousness of of Jesus' birth and uh, and where you will take it all from here. I think you just kind of summed it all up. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That was beautiful. Uh, I particularly fell at the part where you said um, the companion uh, along the journey. Yeah. Uh, and, and it wasn't until reading that, that I had, I either had paid attention to that. I pay attention uh, in this um, partly because the text is there for us um, in a moment, we will we will take a look at Second uh, uh, Samuel and this these these words given to David that are uh, repeated here. Um, he will reign over the house forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Um, and how that um, how that means the birth of Jesus is a continuation of a promise that God has already made. Um, but hearing you. Um, um, uh, focus in on on Mary and Elizabeth made me side what what put it up uh, put it alongside the fact that um, there's also those who have come before them that this story resonates with uh, Hannah and um, and uh, Sarah um, other women who um, did not necessarily have that uh, that partner. But uh, at least we could say they had that history in their, you know, Hannah would have had that history. And for Sarah, it was such an incredible promise that God would show up in their life in that moment and make, make them a promise of what they couldn't do for themselves. Uh, but after, after that, there is, there is at least this, God has done this before and God is doing this again. But I think what is really, really powerful is we don't have to do this alone. Yeah. I love that question. Yeah, and I I think this is an opportunity. It's a unique opportunity. I mean, I know it's like oh goodness, it's Advent, and then you turn around, you know, however many hours later, and you're and you've moved to Christmas. So I know it's that's a hard that's going to be a it's going to be a big day for preachers. But it I think homiletically it affords a really really unique opportunity in that. We can talk about that with the with the Annunciation, but of course, the story right after is Mary visits Elizabeth and actually hears that blessing from her. My uh, blessed are you, and mm -hmm. and how is it that Mary takes that that not only companionship but that blessing? Yes, um, and in and it makes it possible, partly possible for her Magnificat, uh, and and it's in that. And the way in the Magnificat is a reflection on the Annunciation and that blessing, and I and and then and then you know, then we have the birth of John the Baptist and Zechariah's prophecy, but then the birth of Jesus in chapter two in in Luke. So it gives the preacher an opportunity to kind of carry that that story forward of how much is happening before chapter two that that uh, that really lies behind all of the birth of Jesus. And how is it that Mary can go through all of this and do all of this? She carries that blessing with her. She carries that favor and regard uh, of God with her. And, and, and how is that which empowers her to, uh, yeah, to, to do this? So I just, yeah, I think it's a great, great opportunity for preachers. Yeah, what you're describing is a great way of taking us more deeply into Luke 1 and 2, which are just so rich in, in so many ways. One thing I want to say, maybe in addition to all of this, is, is how the story begins in, um, in Luke 1, 26, that Gabriel is sent to Nazareth, and that it's not... Mary could have had a vision. Um, yeah, Mary could have had a vision or you know, been assumed into heaven for some kind of otherworldly journey. This is certainly there in 
you know, in, in the, in the tradition, there are other ways this could have happened, but the Gabriel comes to her, mm -hmm. uh, and visits her. And if you look at some of the art, both classical and modern about how they interact, whether it's kind of Mary's skepticism or Mary's joy, but sometimes it's in a home or in a mm -hmm. garden. And there's this idea of, of coming into her space that I find also really meaningful uh, mm -hmm. in, in this. There's something that prefigures the incarnation itself in that there's also there's a painting as a 21st century artist and uh, paul wolfel i don't know if i'm pronouncing the last name correctly w-o-e-l-f-e-l -E -E who depicts this where mary is seated and gabriel is actually kneeling before her and Ga and um, gabriel has taken off his sandals mm which I think is a, a nod to Exodus three, where God says to Moses, remove your sandals for you're standing on holy ground that, that uh, Gabriel recognizes the holiness of Mary, the holiness of the moment, the holiness of the task. It's, it's this beautiful image. It's kind of a folk art style. There's like a, the, there's a, there's actually an, an, an a sealed envelope being delivered as part of the annunciation in it. But, that that image too of the holiness of the everyday, the holiness of Nazareth, the holiness of Mary herself. That's that if you get that into a sermon in any way, go ahead and do it. Yeah, I would. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that with art, Matt, because that's such a powerful way to enter into the dynamics of of this encounter. And uh, the way in which art artists picture that, I think another way is, uh, you know, poetry, or even hymns. And one one poem that I would draw people's attention to is uh, is Jan Richardson, and it's called Gabriel's Annunciation. And it is uh, it's a it it describes as you're talking about Matt just that that moment of Gabriel coming to her and how uh, he, how Gabriel is equally blessed by her, um, by Mary. And so that's just be another way for preachers to kind of maybe get into some of those dynamics of this really poignant and powerful moment. Second Samuel, you already mentioned that a little bit, Joy. Yeah, yeah. The um, I always appreciate this one and never forget it whenever I think of um, what it means that we think of coming to church to worship God, to find God. And um, in this text, when uh, uh, David wants uh, to be the one to build this place for God, uh, God reminds David that um, God is with us. God moves among us. Um, and that seems just an appropriate, I know I've already talked about how this is, you know, the promise that uh, the descendant of David will continually reign on the throne. But um, when I look at this text and I, and I look at uh, what is this verse five, uh, I'm struck by uh, Emmanuel. God is with us. Um, and God has always been with us. Uh, Caroline, you'd like to remind us that uh, this isn't God's plan uh, pro post Jesus, this has always been God's plan, and 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 so uh, if there's if if this text is being uh, uh, lifted up, uh, to have folks leave recognizing that with us is God's intention wherever we are in the rough places and the smooth in the wilderness, uh, you know, not just in the sanctuary. Um, that that that's what strikes me with with these, this this portion of Second Samuel. Yeah, I'm trying to think what else to say about it. I mean, it obviously helps understand the Annunciation a little better, and right. mm -hmm. uh, um, maybe it helps set some of the Christmas uh, hymnody around kingship into a better mm -hmm. context as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. But it does. I think you're right, Joy. It, it's it's. It, it points to, and people might not recognize this, that the Old Testament throughout has this tension of, does God reside in the temple exclusively, or is God a God who's accessible anywhere? And there's this 
it's not quite a dialectic, but there are these two different themes that are occasionally challenging each other in, in different parts of the Older Testament. And so how does how does Jesus in his incarnate self in some ways weigh in on that? And how do we talk about that in a way that's not a kind of anti-temple right. polemic or something like that, but but that that kind of expresses this idea of a king who doesn't need a throne or doesn't need a traditional palace. Uh, but will reside within God's people. So, and even some of the language of of what God says to David in Second Samuel, I think, is similar to that. This idea of um, even recalling, right? I, I, <laughs> I took you out of the pasture, like when you were following yeah. sheep, stupid yeah. snot nosed kid. I mean, it's kind of like I've been with you, like I have already demonstrated this presence. Mm -hmm. in ways throughout your life that um that you know full well is the i think the implication david mm -hmm. and See, then if people don't it. get it from there the psalm is here to there say it, it one is. more time yes <laughs> yeah yeah the repetition of the steadfast love and faithfulness of god and that's really what that's really what we're talking about and the way in which Mary, of course, will give witness to that in the Magnificat, uh, and and realizing that she's a part of that steadfast love and that and that faithfulness to all generations, and seeing herself as uh, as as integral in that generational steadfastness and promise of God, mm -hmm. and so uh, that and and that's in part what you know what the Samuel text does, but then what the psalmist gives witness to. So the psalm gives gives that language, additional language, vocabulary to what is being said in 2 Samuel and really what's happening with Mary and really what's happening with the birth of Jesus is 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 a demonstration of of God's love um, and God's steadfastness. And yeah. So Another focus of the day that um, uh, you've just named out would be why do we love our Christmas carols? Um, um, the opportunity for us to sing of God's presence, of God's goodness, of God's faithfulness, as Mary did, uh, as um, Miriam did, as the psalmist does, um, and so do so we do. Uh, that might be a, a way to introduce a, a, a one, one of the a familiar familiar um, hymns that will be sung this week. Hmm. That's a good point. It makes reminds me, you know, Christ the King Sunday or the Reign of Christ Sunday was only four weeks ago. And in some ways there's, in some pockets of the church, there's some dissatisfaction with Christ the King Sunday that it sounds a little too triumphalistic, but um, we sure, we like to sing yeah, born as the king of israel and stuff like that at, at yeah. christmas time and so it's it is this idea of what kind of king are you expecting at uh at christmas what kind of king have you learned jesus is by the time you get to the end of the way in which the the christian story gets imprinted on the on the church year yeah uh there should be some consistency in those i imagine and surprise too the kind of king I think that's imagined in Second Samuel seven, and maybe even the psalm, turns out to be a little different. So, is this the uh, benediction that you were talking about a couple of weeks ago, Caroline? Oh, I think that was Matt last week, right? That's me. Yeah, I think last week we had a charge, and I think this week is a benediction. Benediction. Oh, okay. I don't know. We do that in my tradition. We we got all sorts of things that we like to do. So we like to charge people, and they like to benedict. <laughs> <laughs> well, after you've been charged, it's nice to be bent. On exactly. So <laughs> here's a lovely benediction. Yeah. Sorry. It, I would use it that way. I mean, it it yes. really is, I, when you think about how these words could be used at the end of your sermon, they could be used at the end of the service. Uh, and, and I yeah, I, I think, and to imagine these words being that which blesses, <laughs> benedicts people mm -hmm. as they leave that morning and and anticipate uh, anticipate Christmas Eve and the birth of Jesus. I think it makes it's not not only a benediction but makes for a really 
I think, powerful transi transition or <laughs> in between the, the promises of the morning and the promises of Christmas Eve.